Welcome to this virtual talk. My name is Annalise Mundy and I'm the Deputy Director of the Georgia Museum of Art. We are so appreciative of Ulysses' efforts to record his talk that he would have delivered in person at the museum in conjunction with our exhibition, Louis Comfort Tiffany, Treasures from the Driehaus Collection. Ulysses Grant Dietz retired as curator of decorative arts at the Newark Museum in 2017, where he had been since 1980 and was appointed chief curator in 2012. He received his BA in French from Yale University in 1977 and his MA in American Material Culture from the University of Delaware's Wintertour program in 1980. Mr. Dietz has been curator of over 114 exhibitions covering all aspects of the decorative arts from colonial to contemporary. He is particularly proud of his work on the museum's 1885 Ballantine House, named a National Historic Landmark in 1985. The Ballantine House was transformed and reinterpreted between 1992 and 94 with a groundbreaking installation called House and Home. Mr. Dietz has also published numerous articles on decorative arts drawn from the Newark Museum's nationally known collections of art pottery, studio ceramics, silver, jewelry, and 19th century furniture. His most recent publications are Masterpieces of Art Pottery, 1880 to 1930, from the Newark Museum in 2009, and Dream House, The White House as an American Home, released in September 2009 by Acanthus Press in New York. His last book as curator was Jewelry from Pearls to Platinum to Plastic. We hope you enjoy his lecture in this format. Thank you. Hello, I'm Ulysses Dietz, Chief Curator and Curator of Decorative Arts Emeritus at the Newark Museum. Today, in honor of the exhibition of Richard G. House's remarkable collection of works by Louis Comfort Tiffany, I'm going to take a look at Louis Tiffany's work at the White House. The title of my talk is Upgrade, Chester Arthur, Louis Tiffany, and the White House. In 1869, when Julia Grant entered the White House, she found an old building redecorated constantly over the first two thirds of the 19th century, much in need of freshening and repair. She, in fact, a woman of the frontier, wife of a military officer through her entire married life, would be the person to bring the Gilded Age into the White House. Now here you see the White House as it was soon after the Grants settled in, in 1869. The large fountain on the South Lawn was put in by the Grants, who closed the property for the first time in its history, making it into a private estate, not a public assembly place, not a public park. And you see the massive greenhouses off to the, uh, off to the west of the White House over the West Wing, what would become the West Wing, which were among the largest private greenhouses in the United States. Julia, like many housewives of her era, was fascinated by conservatories, by plants, by gardening, and would do a lot with these over the course of her husband's eight years in office. But Julia, like most first ladies in the period, didn't get to do everything she wanted. No first lady got everything she wanted for two reasons. The government had to approve, Congress had to approve appropriations for maintaining and furnishing and repairing the White House, and they tended to be stingy no matter who was in office. Congress always tried to hold back the money. And therefore, first ladies, in their role as housewives, as homemakers, had to make do with what they had. Now here you see in the red room and the green room, Julia's only real effort to change the White House, to put her mark on it early in her husband's first term, was to add these enormous paintings by an artist named Cogswell uh, to make it clear who was there, who was the first lady. In the red room, which was really the family parlor, it was the, it was the parlor that every presidential family spent the most time in downstairs. She put a life-size portrait of herself, surrounded by her family, her famous general husband, modestly off to the side, the lady in charge of the White House, in the Red Room where all of her friends and all of lo all the local people who came to visit would see it. Now in the more ceremonial green room, she put this massive life-size equestrian portrait of her husband, which is literally just sitting on the carpet and leaning against the wall. But everything else in these rooms dates from earlier presidencies. Martha Patterson, who was Andrew Johnson's daughter, 
had been in charge of the decoration you see on the walls and the carpeting, but the furniture comes from earlier administrations. In the Red Room, you have Mrs. Fillmore's piano, Mrs. Tyler's marble table, and Sarah Polk's suite of Meeks furniture from New York from 1847. And in the Green Room, you see Harriet Lane's ebonized furniture from Philadelphia, purchased for her father, James Buchanan, or her uncle, James Buchanan's administration. So Julia made do with what was left in the White House. Julia got a little money in the first term to be able to redecorate, refresh the two most heavily used rooms among the public rooms. The blue room got new carpeting, upholstery, wall covering, and curtains. I cannot guarantee you that this tinted uh, stereo view is remotely accurate. I honestly don't believe that she put blue and white carpeting into a room where 40,000 people a year came and tromped all over it. But this was the showpiece. This was the centerpiece of the First Lady's hostessing at the White House. She also added this enormous crystal chandelier in the middle of the room, which would remain for the rest of the 19th century. And in the state dining room, she made a few key changes. She kept all of the furniture from previous administrations. She added these two enormous crystal chandeliers. She opened up the window on the right of the fireplace onto the West Wing, which faced the conservatories and would face something else that I'll get to in a minute. And the only other thing she did in this room was to take the enormous gilt bronze centerpiece that the Monroes had brought in in 1817 and make it bigger because in this burgeoning gilded age, even the elegance of the 1817 White House wasn't quite enough. The most significant thing Julia did, and the thing that has disappeared most completely, uh, was that she added a billiard room onto the roof of the West Wing Arcade, somehow, we suspect, re-adapting, reusing parts of the construction of the greenhouses in order to transform it into a billiard room, basically a man cave of the Gilded Age for her husband, something that was extremely fashionable all across the country at this period. It was completely paneled in highly polished woods. They've all been specified. They're all the evidence about them survives. President Grant had a beautiful custom-made billiard table that had been given to him. And so this became essentially a family room for the first family, for the Grant family during the Grant administration. It disappeared very quickly after the Grant administration. And uh, this is a conjectural recreation of what the room looked like. Now, this slide shows you the difference between the first term and the second term for Julia. The first, on, on the left, you see the Martha Patterson East Room, pretty much decorated exactly as it was when Julia entered the White House. You have Jackson's chandeliers, you have the Monroe's 1817 furniture, and you have mirrors and overmantels and mantelpieces from the various 19th century administrations uh, that led up to the Civil War. So the room was very opulent, but in a kind of provincial way. The only thing Julia got to change in the first administration was the carpeting, and that carpeting appears in the picture on the right because she kept it for her own uh, major renovations to the room in her husband's second administration uh, when she got more money from Congress and decided she was going to turn the East Room into a ballroom worthy of this new Gilded Age. She put in these enormous crystal chandeliers, one in each of the three bays that she had created by the introduction of massive beams on columns that divided the 80 foot long space into three uh, more coherent spaces. She also included enormous new gold and white wooden mantelpieces and over mirrors, and a whole new suite of maroon and gold velvet and silk upholstered furniture, which did not last long. But there it was in all its opulence. And in 1874, when her daughter Nellie was married in this room, this was truly the most opulent ballroom in all of America. That would change very fast. Here you see another thing that's critical that she did in the second administration, in her husband's second term. She went to New York, desperate to refurnish the family parlor, the Red Room, in something that was up to date, that really suited the burgeoning new wealth that followed the Civil War. She went to a firm called Herder Brothers that were furniture makers, but who also had a staff of decorators who would create beautiful interiors for the newly rich. 
and she bought a whole enormous suite of furniture, very much in cutting edge style uh, for the Red Room. On the left is one of the surviving chairs, upholstered uh, in red and gold silk, that is still in the White House collection. And on the right, you see a picture of the Red Room soon after the Grants left, when the Hayses had moved in, and you can see some of the Herder Brothers furniture. To the left of the fireplace is a fire screen. Julia and Ulysses Grant were given for the White House by, B by the Viennese after the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia. And on the center table from Herder Brothers that Julia chose for the Red Room, you see an enormous silver centerpiece ornament called Hiawatha's Barge, made in Rhode Island by the Gorham Silver Company that Julia also bought for the White House at the Centennial Exhibition. But the decoration you see here is what Julia had done to upgrade it before she and her family left the White House. The furniture in these two images are both forms that Julia chose for the White House in 1874 from Herder Brothers. On the left is a very modernist, now think of this Victorian stuff as modernist, it's a little hard, but this was very modern, uh, the sort of Japanese style chair based on English prototypes that Herder had designed and became a mainstay of a lot of their best interiors. This one belongs to the Newark Museum and has an ebonized or black finish, but Julia chose this exact form in rosewood to be accent chairs in the Red Room decor. On the right is still in the White House, the center table in a sort of French Renaissance style by Herder Brothers uh, that has survived in the house was the center table for the Red Room. And the reason it survives is that Louis Tiffany didn't like it. It was too old fashioned. The style is really of about 1868, 1870, whereas the other chair is really out of the 1870s and would have been seen as more modern. So the center table survives, and I'll deal with uh, that phenomenon later on. And so here we go, as Julia leaves the White House after eight years of loving it as no first lady had loved it before, and this is the White House as she changed it. Now, it looks pretty recognizable to most people, but you can see on the left the great columns dividing the fireplaces that hold, held the beams in the East Room, and on the far right you can see two changes that were significant. In the upper right corner is the state dining room, the window next to the fireplace that she reopened onto the roof of the West Wing. And you also see a big staircase. Julia tore out the original 1817 rebuild staircase and put in this huge Victorian staircase, not just because it suited the taste of the time, but because it created a much larger sitting space upstairs. This would become the West Sitting Hall eventually. And you have to remember that the president's offices were all on the east side of the second floor and impinged upon the family's privacy throughout the history of the White House until the turn of the century. And then in 1881, James Garfield is assassinated and Chester Allen Arthur, 52 years old, a widower and a socialite from New York City, trained as a lawyer, very well versed in the ways of the spoils system of the political world enters the White House as president for the first time. Here you see the White House draped in mourning for the dead president, and then comes into the White House, Chester Allen Arthur comes into the White House and finds it as it had been left by the previous administration, specifically the Garfields, who had a lot of decorating done by W.B. Moses and company, who were a local and highly respected furniture and decorating firm in Washington, D.C. This is the green room as Moses did it for the Garfields. And it's nice, it's fine. It's like any upscale parlor might have been in any town anywhere in America. But for a cosmopolitan bon vivant like Chester Arthur, this was not up to snuff. He left the green room as it was because the green room didn't matter much in the daily life of the White House. But he looked at the other rooms and decided he needed to do something special. And who did he turn to but Louis Comfort Tiffany? Here's a quote from Tiffany, and this is a remarkable document done in 1907 by Esther Singleton, who wrote the first two volume book on the history of the White House. She interviewed Louis Tiffany, who was far from being retired in 1907, about what he had done in the White House. Let me read this quote to you. At that time, we decorated the blue room, the east room, the red room, and the hall between the red and east rooms together with the glass screen contained therein. The carpets, curtains, and upholstery of these rooms corresponded 
with the wall decoration. Uh, his, his interview with Esther Singleton for this book in 1907 is amazing for two reasons. One, he doesn't tell us nearly enough. She didn't really care that much about the lost Tiffany decorations. But it's also, it must have been painful for him because every trace of what he had done in the White House was gone. Everything was gone. Uh, and Esther was picking his mind to try to find out what he'd done. So it's this great historic moment at the, at the hinge between the 19th and the 20th century. Now, why Louis Tiffany? Well, because Louis Tiffany had a famous name. Louis Comfort Tiffany was the son of Charles Louis Tiffany, spelled L-E-W-I-S, uh, from who owned the biggest brand, the greatest luxury brand in America, Tiffany and Company. And Louis Tiffany had been raised to be artistic, but also to be a businessman. And by the late 1870s, he had developed a business that ultimately would become all about decorating interiors. Now, decorators existed, as I've mentioned, through the furniture manufacturers who did furniture and upholstery, like Herder Brothers and Potier and Stymus and George Shasty. But these were really furniture companies who did decorating. Louis Tiffany was not a manufacturer. He had things made for his jobs, but he was an artist. He saw himself as an artist who conceived of these rooms as artistic holes, and then he would design every single aspect of the room and create these visions. And the very first one he did in 1879 was for George Kemp, the very rich drug manufacturer in New York City. And I have no doubt that Chester Arthur knew who the Kemps were and possibly had even been in their house. But this room, the Arabian Parlor, designed and created by Louis Tiffany in 1879, would have been certainly an inspiration for bringing that young man to the White House. Here we have two pieces that have survived from that room, a room that has long tantalized curators all over the country. On the left is a big inlaid armchair with shallow carved decoration on the arms and skirt uh, that belongs to the Munson Williams Proctor Institute in Utica, New York. And on the right is a smaller, entirely inlaid armchair of a very distinctive form, and I'll talk about that in a second, uh, that belongs to the Newark Museum. So far, these are the only two intact pieces of furniture from that house. Now, you have to understand that this blonde wood you see, this honey color, uh, is oxidizing over a hundred and some years. Uh, originally, these are made out of Hollywood and originally would have been the color of ivory, sort of a soft, uh, creamy white, and they have just darkened with age. The lower armchair that belongs to the Newark Museum was inspired by a chair in Louis Tiffany's own apartment. On the right is a photograph of Tiffany's apartment, and in the red dotted circle, you can see a 17th century Indo-Portuguese carved chair with spindles. And on the far left, you see another, views, uh, another version of that chair, a 17th century Indo-Portuguese chair, meaning it was made in India to Portuguese specifications using Indian craftsmanship uh, that belongs to a museum. Uh, but this kind of chair would have been both exotic and familiar, combining Europe and Asia in one form. Clearly, Louis Tiffany was inspired by that for his work um, at the Kemp House. And here in this slide, you see another shot of the Kemp Arabian Parlor, and it was called the Arabian Parlor in the period. The ceiling was done in a silver leaf, which was not literally silver, but would have been uh, platinum or aluminum or something like that covered in textiles and glass tiles with all of this inlaid and carved white wood furniture. And you can see the dotted lines that outline the two chairs that belong to the Munson Proctor and to the Newark Museum. This was the kind of cutting edge interior that had Chester Arthur interested and had him inspired to bring Tiffany down to Washington. A couple of other com commissions that would have brought Louis Tiffany to fame early in his career like this was the great 1880 interior, the Veterans Room at the 7th Regiment Armory on Park Avenue in New York City. The room exists today and in fact is the only surviving intact, untouched interior uh, from Tiffany's career. It's a room that's very well known to anybody who's gone to antique shows at the Armory on Park Avenue in New York. This next slide shows some color shots of it. Uh, I honestly can't remember if this is before or after the recent redecoration, a restoration of the room. But you can see the kind of exotic textures, 
textured, multicolored room with elaborate paneling and stained glass, great wrought iron fixtures. You can see what Louis Tiffany could do. And it was related to what was going on in the larger decorating world, related to the aesthetic reform movement of the 1870s and 1880s, but it had a distinctive look that was really unique in the country. Here is a shot of the fireplace, and I simply point out the use of the turquoise glass panels, uh, glass tiles across uh, the mantle facing, uh, which nobody else did. It's a distinctive characteristic of what Louis Tiffany was interested in. And two more details. On the right, you see the sort of Islamicized, exotic, Saracenic. There were lots of words that were used to describe this exotic Middle Eastern uh, decoration, which didn't necessarily imply an understanding of Middle Eastern culture or art, but an appreciation of the patterning and the textures and the abstraction, the use of color in Middle Eastern interiors. And on the left, most importantly to me, is this marvelous window, I, one of the earliest surviving windows and the earliest surviving from a commercial interior com uh, commission that uh, Louis Tiffany did. And you can see the abstraction of design, making this almost look like a modern painting, and the softness of the colors, the complex use of off colors. This isn't red, white, blue, green. This is olive and ochre and orange and turquoise and complicated colors and geometric patterns that, again, are thinking about the Middle East, but doing something completely modern and completely unique to Louis Tiffany. And third, our celebrity interiors, the most famous interior that Louis Tiffany did at the time was for Samuel Clemens, known as Mark Twain, one of the most famous people in America, one of the first entertainment celebrities who was not a singer or an actor, who was simply a performer who would get up on stage and talk to packed houses and had become an enormously successful character in America. He built himself an enormous house in Hartford, Connecticut, and had Louis Tiffany, Tiffany's burgeoning young firm in 1881 come in and decorate the house. Interestingly enough, when we get to Tiffany and the White House, the one room that gets forgotten and was forgotten by a lot of people for a long time was the dining room. And so I'm quoting from myself in my book on the White House, Dream House, uh, talking about the dining room because Louis Tiffany never mentions that to Esther Singleton. For the dining room at the other end of the state floor, Tiffany's contributions included a new color scheme of glowing yellows with painted stenciling in silver and huge circular sconces of hammered metal. This is inadequate, but all of the words to describe Tiffany's interiors are quite inadequate, especially without color photography. You can only imagine, and curators have spent a lot of time thinking about this, you can only imagine what the effect really was, but you get a sense of this glowing yellows means yellow, but an ochre yellow, and bronzes and coppers and oranges and things that merge together. Uh, and he would have had shimmering wall surfaces that would have been reflective and shaded. And then the woodwork would have been textured and touched up with silver and the ceilings and the plaster work would have been touched up in silver stenciling. And so you would have had both complicated patterns uh, and a complex but subtle color scheme. So the only hints at Tiffany's decor uh, that survive from the period uh, can be seen in this picture of the state dining room done uh, after the room was redecorated by Edgar Jurgensen of Hartford for Caroline Harrison. And what you see is an extremely different, a very elaborate Gilded Age interior, much more in a kind of Renaissance mode, but uh, still very much typical of the time but the exoticism, the sort of ephemeral orientalist fantasy of whatever Louis Tiffany did in this room has all been swept away. But like all first ladies, Caroline Harrison didn't get all the money she wanted, so she had to keep some of the stuff. So Julia Grant's chandeliers are still there. Uh, and Louis Tiffany's side chairs, the walnut side chairs that he commissioned or ordered or specced or designed, we don't know, uh, for the state dining room are there. And the four huge hammered metal sconces are still there. Now you'll see on the left, at the upper left side, Mrs. Harrison had Jurgensen design these elaborate wooden grills that went into all of the stateroom windows uh, on, the, on the south side of the house. They were not only elaborate in themselves, but they were backed with colored glass 
to echo the color scheme of the room. Now there's amber glass in the back of these screens, so it suggests that maybe Mrs. Harrison kept something of the yellow color scheme of Louis Tiffany's room, but we can't tell because all we have is this photograph. In a color magazine illustration of the era, a lithograph, you can see some sort of a state dinner in the Harrison State Dining Room, and you get a sense of the Tiffany chairs, which were in walnut, and the sconces, which at this point uh, were probably coppered or, or had, had the silver removed and were copper colored. Uh, we don't know exactly what that means, and these are very unsatisfying images of the sconces, but that's what we've got. These are details taken from a period photograph. You can see this is the best image of the sconce we could get. Uh, Caroline Harrison had the house electrified, so Tiffany's gas fixtures had been replaced by adorable sort of pointy Edison light bulbs. But you can see these great hammered metal sconces. Now these might have been silver because silver reads as dark on a photograph like this, but they seem to have repoussé busts, presumably of great figures in American history. I have no idea. There is no specs for these anywhere in the archives, uh, and therefore we can't be quite sure. But you can see, you can get a sense of the simple and sturdy, but rather elegant and very modern side chairs that Tiffany used, both here and in the family dining room, uh, that, we, that he either designed himself and had made, or he simply found chairs that he thought were appropriate. Uh, my feeling is if he could, if he was given the money to design and custom make these chairs, and it was a large order of chairs, a couple of hundred, uh, that he might well have done that. So uh, we we can only speculate. Now the East Room was the next room in terms of how little Louis Tiffany got to do in it, but what he did had a great impact and actually lasted quite a long time. In the East Room, we only did the ceiling, which was done in silver with the design in various tones of ivory. Now, such a tantalizing image. Uh, and what we have from the photographic evidence is this. This is the East Room as it was, it, as basically it was for Chester Arthur, but later in the 19th century after Arthur was gone, uh, new furniture put in either by the Garfields or a later administration, Julius Chandeliers, all of the architectural decor of the room is absolutely intact, and yet you can see the geometricized, the abstraction of the ceiling that Louis Tiffany put in, very different from the sort of Baroque ceiling decoration that Julia Grant had put in. Here are two more images. You can see a close-up of the ceiling, and what we may be looking at there, uh, the dark patterning on that geometric ceiling, uh, you may be looking at, that may all be silver leaf, that may be all reflective metal, picked out with an ivory contrast. It's very hard to tell because he's rather vague in his descriptions of it. Uh, but there was iconography in here that was abstracted and geometricized so that it was almost unrecognizable. And on the left is a, is a colored slide that you can't trust the color of. They never really were very careful, but you can see that right up to the end of the 19th century, uh, the ceiling uh, survived even with new electric light fixtures added all over it to brighten up the room even as Julia Grant's gas fixtures, and, which have been electrified, and all of her architectural additions remained in the house. Now the most important room, the blue room, is the room that curators are very wistful about because the descriptions of it, the surviving photographs of it in black and white, all suggest that it must have been quite a dazzling room done entirely with textiles and wallpaper because Tiffany was not given large amounts of money to redo the room. He had to create an effect that was all about surface. So here's his quote. The blue room or robin's egg room, as it is sometimes called, was decorated in robin's egg blue for the main color with ornaments in a hand pressed paper touched out in ivory, gradually deepening as the ceiling was approached. This is from 1907. Here are two photographs of the room in the 19th century before the Tiffany interiors were changed. Uh, both of these are uh, from close to the Arthur administration, and so they've, they survived. They show the room intact. On the left is the full scheme. You can see that the Buchanan furniture from 1859 is still there, uh, but the fireplace has been uh, replaced. Even though the overmantel is from an earlier administration, Julia Chandelier is still there, but the mantelpiece is painted ivory 
and has turquoise glass tiles set into it. So he's using the tiles that he would later use, uh, that he had used previously, excuse me, uh, in the uh, veterans room on Park Avenue in New York City. But look at the walls. You can see an enormous circular sconce, which I'll talk about in a moment. And you can see the elaborate patterning. Actually, on both of these slides, you see the elaborate patterning, which you have to realize was three-dimensional. It was, it was uh, embossed so that it stuck out from the surface. And it would have been picked out in ivory and in silver, but also in other colors. Tiffany forgets that there are other colors. There are little details, little jewel-like shimmers of color. But also what you can't see is from the chair rail to the cornice, the color went from what we went from pale robin's egg blue to a deeper turquoise. And that is impossible to photograph. I mean, it's impossible to photograph today, uh, but in the 19th century with no color, you can only get, uh, you can only imagine the effect of it on the eye. And the curtains, notice, are of a turquoise satin uh, and with dark ultramarine velvet below the chair rail and up at the cornice. The furniture was all upholstered according to the documents, was upholstered in silk canvas. And that's a puzzling thing for textile people because they don't know what silk canvas is, except it suggests that it's some sort of a woven silk that would have been heavy duty because this room got a lot of use. People really spent time here. It was for big parties. People sat, they spilled, they spent time abusing this room in a way that the other rooms on the state floor were not. My favorite fantasy recreation of this room is one that I found online, quite honestly, and I think it gives the best sense of what the blue room would have looked like. Blue was an unfashionable color. Uh, the blue room of the early 19th century was completely outmoded. Red and green and gold were in fashion, but in the Gilded Age, in this part of the Gilded Age in the 1880s, uh, off colors were in, tertiary colors. So turquoise, robin's egg blue, would have been a way to make unfashionable blue fashionable. But here you get a sense of the shimmering silk on the upholstery, the multicolored but more pragmatic uh, turquoise and patterned carpet, and then something of the shaded walls, still with Julia Chandelier in the middle, but Julia Chandelier from, the 18, uh, from uh, 1870, echoed by the huge silvered metal and opalescent glass light fixtures three feet across that dotted four corners or four four quadrants of this huge oval room 40 feet by 30 feet by 18 feet tall an enormous oval room still the largest oval room in the country at this period peter waddell who is sort of the official historical painter for the White House Historical Association, created his own version of what the Blue Room must have looked like. I think it's a little too sky blue for my taste. But again, it shows you how difficult it is to understand the subtleties, the nuances, the sort of magic effect that firsthand vision of this room would have uh, done. If this had been created in an era where they had cell phones, there would be lots of photographs. People would have been photographing this madly at every party they went to. But you can see uh, sort of to the left of center, one of the large sconces, and you get a sense of how the sconces echoed the patterning on the wallpaper behind it, but also echoed the three-dimensional sparkle, uh, the opalescent glass, obviously with bits of other colors, and then the range, the sort of circular corona of gas fixtures against the mirror at the back. Color was everything in this period, and the White House uh, embraced the varieties of color that people expected in the 1880s by using tertiary colors. So you don't have emerald green, you have olive green, you have sage green, you have blue green. And in the red room, which you see on the right, and I'll talk about more in a second, you don't have bright red, you have rust red, you have Pompeian red, you have terracotta red. And here you see that. This room, according to the second phase of Louis Tiffany's decoration, which helps date these photographs quite nicely. These postcards, they were color lithograph postcards. So they're not entirely accurate. They never get the details right, so you have to be slightly suspicious. 
So Louis Tiffany says to Esther Singleton in 1907, in the red room, the walls were red, duh, with a frieze in which the motif was an interlacing of a design embodying both eagles and flags. The ceiling was in old gold. Such a fascinating quote, because I've never been able to see eagles or flags in the design of the red room. And so clearly Tiffany is saying this because that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to get the sense that he was doing something American and modern, but he's abstracted them to the point where they're not easy to see. Here is a first phase of Louis Tiffany's interior for the red room. Uh, the red walls shaded as the blue room did, but shaded in the opposite direction. The fixture is from a much earlier presidency, but you can see that Louis Tiffany changed the mantelpiece and the overmantel. He used Julia Grant's Herder furniture from 1874, but he got rid of the center table, which was much too French and sort of old fashioned for him. He chose large, what he called Japanese vases to go on either side of the fireplace. They were in pink and green. Uh, they eventually moved to the green room and they're in fact Chinese, you can tell from the look, but he kept other things in the room. Uh, like all of the decorators who worked on the White House, Louis Tiffany was forced to make do. But the cornice and the ceiling, you can see the extraordinary ceiling decoration. And if you look really closely, you can recognize that there actually is a pattern of stars in the ceiling, probably done in silver leaf or gold leaf, or both for that matter. Uh, and that the abstract sort of Islamic ceiling effect is in fact very carefully calculated to have this patriotic iconography. The second phase of the Red Room looks pretty much like the first phase, except that the, uh, the Japanese vases, the Chinese vases, have been removed and replaced with a pair of huge French porcelain historicized painted vases that came from Tiffany and Company. I found these in arch archival photographs of the Tif in the Tiffany archives, and we know they came out of Tiffany and Company, but were certainly made in France. You can also see up against the back wall uh, in this picture, a couple of new pieces of furniture uh, that Louis Tiffany, I think that Louis Tiffany designed for the room uh, at, uh, in, the, in the year after uh, he finished the work for Chester Arthur. This marvelous detail taken by Francis Benjamin Johnston, the most important documenter by photograph of the White House in the 19th century, was not intended to document Louis Tiffany. It was intended to document these beautiful Ormolu objects that came from Paris for the Monroes in 1817 and are part of that famous group of surviving Ormolu objects uh, that have been famous in the White House since they came in. But right behind it in Francis Johnston's photograph is the Tiffany fireplace. You can see the glass tiles. We don't know what color they were, certainly not turquoise, uh, as in the blue room, but in some other shimmering glass. Uh, panels of red leather set into the mahogany frame. And then most excitingly, these square panels of stained glass, of leaded glass, right up against the wood, but across the frieze at the top of the mantelpiece. Uh, this is something where uh, distinctively Tiffany that no other decorator was working in this kind of material. So his interest in glass is really important and it will get even more important in this house. Here is Peter Waddell's rather successful interpretation, his fantasy of what this room must have looked. You get a sense of the shaded color from dark to light. You get a sense of the silver and gold stars as the Islamic pattern of the ceiling recedes in the nighttime under the gaslight and sparkles with this uh, image of stars. Uh, I still don't quite see the eagles anywhere in here. Maybe they're the V-shaped motifs in the gold cornice. But again, Tiffany's abstraction would have made all of this somewhat hard to see because his point was design, not patriotism. Very quickly, when the Har Harrisons came in, several things happened. All of the wall treatments and ceiling treatments that Louis Tiffany did were swept away instantly. So that's it, a very short period, less than, less than a decade did those interiors survive intact. But Mrs. Harrison kept the fireplace with its uh, over mantel mirror with those great stained glass panels and the leather panels across the mahogany. And she kept the furniture that Louis Tiffany designed for the room. She also kept Julia Grant's furniture and she added portraits 
and and basically did what every first lady has always done. She also had an architect come in or a craftsman come in and design new door casings for the red room to match both the furniture and the mantelpiece. Here's another view of the Harrison red room. You can see all of the Tiffany details are gone except the furniture and Julia Grant's furniture is still there. When Frances Johnston photographed the room, she made a point of photographing this furniture, placing it so that it could be seen in conjunction with the woodwork of the doorways. So clearly this was important to somebody uh, in the 1880s and would survive in the house until the great purge of 1902. Now, the final detail that is the most kind of romantically evoked in curatorial minds is the stained glass. Here you see the incredible 18th century front door of the White House in carved local stone, but set into the original doorway that John Adams would have known is Louis Tiffany's stained glass front doors. Long gone. We have no idea where they went. The opalescent glass screen, Louis Tiffany says, in the hall, which reached from the floor to the ceiling, had also a motif of eagles and flags interlaced in the Arabian method. The Arabian method. So this is sort of proof that he was stylizing and abstracting things the way he did at the Park Avenue Armory, the way he did at Mark Twain's house, uh, the way he did in the Arabian parlor for George Kemp. He was taking patriotic images and stylizing them to suit his own artistic vision, his own fascination with the Orient. And here with a panel from the Park Avenue Armory set in to remind you is a black and white shot of the screen set as it was into the original triple arch of uh, James Hoban, but installed by Louis Tiffany. Already here, the Tiffany decorating uh, has disappeared. Uh, this is a, a different decor that was not done by Louis Tiffany, but the screen survives. The screen stayed intact. And in Peter Waddell's interpretation of it from 2004, you get a sense of the colors. And I think I can see where the eagles might be, but this is really about abstract color, abstract pattern. It's a very modern idea. It's almost, in 1881, looking forward to the modern art styles. I dare not say Art Nouveau because people will freak out, but uh, the modern art styles at the end of the 19th century. It's very avant-garde in the way it treats abstraction, but it also is very subtle in the way it treats color, and that's what we can only imagine. Another view of the screen from later on after the Harrison ele electrical work was done and Caroline Harrison had had the hall. This is the outer hall uh, redecorated. And this survived right until 1899-1900 uh, when McKinley was assassinated and Theodore Roosevelt became the youngest president ever to rule the United States. Here we have a shot from the turn of the century. Just as Chester Arthur had come into the White House in 1881 after an assassinated president and looked around and said, this is not what we need. This is not our brand. This is not the optics we want for now. Teddy Roosevelt came in and looked at this White House, very familiar to him from the way his family had lived, from the way people he knew had lived in the past. But he saw a hodgepodge a Victorian hodgepodge. The word Victorian was even being used. Uh, Victoria would die during Teddy Roosevelt's first term. But the idea of Victorian meant old fashioned, stuffy, out of style. And he looked at all these uh, interiors from the late 19th century and said, this has got to go. We need a new image. And he put together a commission and created an entirely new White House, hiring McKim Meaden White, uh, Stanford White being the decorator, specifically, uh, to come in and make the White House look like the outside of the White House did, look like this great English country house, and to look like the kind of house that the president of a rising world power would live in. And the result was this. The result, in fact, was a White House that looked like nothing it had ever looked like before. It was a modern fantasy created for a modern president that thought it was creating a White House that looked like the White House Washington would have wanted, that Jefferson lived in, but it didn't. 
He swept away the original th triple arches in the hall and created this magnificent but chilly Franco-English palace, which is the way the White House looks today. And here you see it as it looked in the, in the early 20th century with the great portrait of Teddy Roosevelt in the corner. So Louis Tiffany by 1902 was gone. Everything, he, he was not dead. He was very much alive and would continue to work for another 20 years as a designer and decorator and a purveyor of luxury goods for elegant people's houses. All of his glass work was still being produced. His lamps were still being produced. But the great early work, the most amazing early work he did, especially what he did for the White House, had disappeared. And except for that mention in 1907 in Esther Singleton's book, it was almost entirely forgotten until the 1960s when interest in Louis Tiffany would rise again. And once again, the work he did for the White House would become legend in the minds of American curators. Thank you so much.